I can see some chat coming up here, which is good, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to do a, just a quick introduction, everybody, and then we'll, we'll set up the first question and then uh, we'll just get going here. Um, first of all, I, I want to introduce our guest to everybody. We've got Butch Vig, who is a drummer for Garbage, producer Woo! for Nirvana, uh, Foo Fighters, Goo Goo Dolls, Smashing Pumpkins, amongst many, many other groups. Um, and for CSR, we've got, uh, you know, kind of a special connection with him because he was our first uh, celebrity judge that we had for our first Battle of the Bands back in 2000, uh, 2018. Um, so um, we were, you know, we we're looking forward to having him back this year. And since uh, the situation, we had to cancel our Battle of the Bands, but we're so lucky to have him back um, to do this interview with, with us, which I think is going to be incredibly special for everybody. So um, thanks again, Butch, for doing this. Um, yeah, man. Um, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm bummed out, y'all, that uh, we can't do the Battle of the Bands. I was really looking forward to it. But we have a little challenge we're going to throw at the end of the Q&A today that might get you excited. But it's going to be a sort of a Battle of the Bands thing. So it's going to be cool. Awesome. Well, I, I want to start off with this question. Um, this is my own question, but I'm um, not really a question. But can you give us a little bit of a background of how you got started in music? Like, your earliest memory of making music to maybe how you got into um, working with garbage in your studio in Wisconsin. Um, if you can start off with that, that'd be great. Well, I was very lucky. I grew up in a musical household. My mother, Betty, was a music teacher. And from a very young age, I was exposed to tons of music. And um, she made me take piano lessons from first grade to sixth grade, which um, I didn't like that much. My, my piano teacher was really, really, really strict, very much like the Russian, the old school Russian ones where they crack your hands with a ruler if you make a mistake. Um, <laughs> but in sixth grade, I, I, I took up the drums and, uh, but I, I, I learned to, to play them properly. I, I did, it, did it through sight reading. I played in the orchestra. After I did that for a couple of years, then my mom bought me a drum kit. And uh, I started playing in, in uh, with my buddies in a band in, in junior high and high school in Viroqua, Wisconsin, a really small town in Wisconsin. And uh, I got interested in trying to learn how to write songs. And uh, we wrote one original song. I, 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 when I was 16, we started a band called Eclipse. And uh, we wrote one original song. And uh, we tried to get it recorded and my mom called the local newspaper in La Crosse, Wisconsin. I remember very well, the critic's name was Lindy Shannon. And uh, my mom said, uh, my, my son's got a band, he wants to record a single. And he said, not possible. They don't have a manager, they don't have a label, they don't have a publisher, they're not ready. They don't even have a producer. What, how are they gonna record a song? And I kind of got ticked off at that. And I sort of decided I'm gonna do it myself and I, I borrowed my friend's two-track two tape recorder, an old analog tape recorder, and recorded our rehearsals. And, uh, and we had a song that we thought we were going to put out as a single. Now, we never did release it as a single, but that was the first time I got into recording. And my mom encouraged me all the time, you know, just whatever you're doing, if, if you're passionate about it, just follow, follow the path you're going to go on. And... I graduated from Brooklyn. when I went to UW-Madison and, and eventually got a degree in film. I went into Com Arts and got a degree in film, but I spent a lot of that time also taking music classes. And I took four years of uh, electronic music, which was groundbreaking for me because the first thing my instructor, Dan Harris, said on day one, he took the keyboards out of the studio. He said, I do not want any switched on Bach. So every sound we made had to be made by running oscillators into filters and turning knobs. We had a, a old Moog synthesizer, a huge modular rack of Moogs and uh, an ARP 2600. So the sounds were quite unusual and strange. It was rarely melodic, um, but I found that uh, really inspiring because as, as I started to realize I wanted to get into recording, becoming a recording engineer and a producer, I realized that music is not always about tonality. There's a lot of things about it. Space and, uh, and abrasion and dissonance are equally as important as, as beautiful notes running together. While I was doing that, I met Duke Erickson, who's one of our guitarists in Garbage, and started playing in a band called Spooner. We were sort of a new wave pop band in Madison, and we wrote our own music, and we put out 
over the course of you know five or six years, we put out three albums and a couple EPs and a single, and we got very popular in the Madison and the Wisconsin uh, club circuit. And uh, we, when we would go into record, I just took it upon myself to sort of figure out what was going on. I would ask the engineer, "Why are you miking the drums this way? Why, why are you doing that? Tell me why you're doing that." I would ask the producer if we could afford to have one. Um, what decisions he was making and why he was doing that. I was literally absorbing every single thing that happened when I was in those environments. And uh, uh, the first Spooner record we made, Every Corner Dance, we worked with a guy named Gary Klebe, and he was in a band called Shoes, and they had been done a DIY record on a four-track tape recorder, got signed with a huge deal to Electra Records. And Gary knew a lot about the studio, and he kind of took me under his wing. And even though I was a drummer, um, I was, you know, I could still play piano, I could play guitar a little bit, play bass a little bit. Gary knew that I wanted to sort of put my eggs out all over the place and, and to put my tentacles out there. And he said, don't just be a drummer, you know, make, take your, your passion into all this, into recording, into writing songs, into arranging songs, and, into, into trying to produce music and, and learn how to do that. And I really took that to heart. And... Uh, I know this is long-winded. When I finished UW Madison, I had a choice to try and get a job in the in the uh, film industry, and I I toyed with coming out to Los Angeles and trying to start at the bottom and work my app through a film studio. Um, but I was pretty entrenched in the Madison music scene at that point, and I had met one of my classmates, Steve Marker, and for some inexplicable reason, we decided to open up a recording studio with no business knowledge, no idea of how to do that at all. It was very DIY. And we pulled our money together and bought an eight track recorder and uh, just went around to all the local clubs and we'd see bands. We'd go up after they played and give them a card and say, Hey, if you want to record, we got a studio in East Washington Avenue. Come on in, you know, get a real estate and come on in. Uh, we would initially, we didn't charge them anything. If they brought the tape, then that was, that was good enough. And after a couple of months, we started getting busy. We charged $5 an hour, which... <laughs> We weren't even sure that people would want to pay that, but they did, and uh, and we got really busy. And then that that was in uh, 1984. And then about every three years, we would have a growth. We went from eight track to 16 track. Three years later, we went to 24 track. All these local bands led to me recording some punk bands that got big on the Madison music scene. And then they got signed to a label in Chicago called Touch and Go, a band called Kildos in particular. Yeah, and uh, if you don't know Killdoes, are they're a god awful sound, but they're amazing. <laughs> but they released a couple albums, and all of a sudden, bands like uh, Nirvana started calling me and Billy Corgan from Smashing Pumpkins because they heard the Killdoes record, and all of a sudden, these bands started coming to Smart Studios, and literally, and in, in within a, about eighteen months or two years, these underground bands blew up into the mainstream. And uh, my life changed profoundly, especially when I did Nevermind uh, by Nirvana, that it completely changed uh, my world because all of a sudden I had these opportunities to sort of pick and choose what I wanted to do, which was great. So I know that was long winded, Mr. D, but that's kind of, that's sort of a, a tangent of, of uh, how I got there. I want to say one other thing though about my mom, who was my biggest supporter, probably my, one of my biggest fans. Um, she loved music when I when I was in junior high I was exposed to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones she bought those records she played me Perry Como and Frank Sinatra the Tijuana Brass Theolonious Monk uh, musicals like on a clear day you can see forever you would listen to country music in the afternoons polka music in the morning on the on the radio I heard all of that and my mom would say listen to that melody that is absolutely genius and it could be in a polka song and um I never felt elitist, and I do not to this day about music. I'm not only into hip hop or only into rock and roll or only into classical. I love all kinds of music, and I think that's been a really good thing for me to have to have been exposed to that through my life, and it's still a good influence today that I listen to a lot of different genres of music. No, that's. I mean, that's that's such a great response, and I I love how you ended that with. Um, you know, some insight onto how your mom influenced your listening. Um, I know like for me growing up, like my, the, the main music I listened to from my parents, my dad loved uh, David Byrne. Um, he loved Talking Heads and he loved Red Hot Chili Peppers. And then my mom loved the Beatles. So I had really no classical backing at all. 
and it just kind of came to me. But because of that, you know, I still listen to the Beatles. And as a matter of fact, our musical theater ensemble class right now, they're all working on arrangements of Beatles tunes because that's, you know, that's where my background came from. So um, very cool. Love, yeah. Yeah. I love how you added that in there. Well, we're going to go ahead and go into some of the questions that were submitted by students. Um, and so this first question is coming from one of our students in our winds and jazz program, Alec Reyes, who's a saxophonist. He plays bass. He's kind of a multi-instrumentalist. Um, but uh, I'm going to start off with this question because I think that there's a lot that can go into this. But Alec asks, do you have a few albums that you think everyone should listen to? Wow, that's a that's a tough one. Um, I, I could probably give you a list with like my hundred, uh, with 100 records that you should listen to. Um, obviously for me, being sort of a rock pop producer, um, to me, one of the the records that really pushed boundaries, and it, it's a cliche to say this, but it's true, is Sgt. Pepper's by the Beatles. Um, you know, when I heard that record for the first time, my mom bought it and brought it home and I listened to it with the headphones and I could not figure out what was going on, this crazy panning and psychedelic effects and they did tape edits and just, it, it did not sound like a band in a room playing together. It was totally a record made in the studio and I just freaked out when I heard it. Uh, and it, it, it's something, there's something about that record that uh, has stood the test of time for obvious reasons, but it's not just the production, the songs are great. I mean, the Beatles were amazing songwriters. Speaking of melody, Paul McCartney's probably the most, one of the most genius mel melodic writers of, of the 20th and 21st century. I mean, he's, he's just, he's so gifted. But that, I would say that record is, uh, for me was quite groundbreaking because I probably heard it when I was, you know, eighth grade or seventh grade, something like that, really young. But I, I do remember profoundly at the time that it was, uh, it was very powerful. Uh, I also, to this day, I love um, Kind of Blue by Miles Davis. My mom also listened to a lot of jazz. And uh, I still find that record incredibly emotional and uh, evocative and just how he lets notes hang and, and, and this, it's the space between the notes. And uh, it's hard to describe, but it's, uh, it, it's incredibly emotional when I listen to that record. Maybe it's because you know, I grew up listening to it with my parents, so there's some nostalgia to it, but it's definitely worth listening to because uh, it's the total opposite from Sgt. Pepper's, but those two records are absolute classics. I, I have to put one punk rock record in there too because I kind of felt like uh, Miles was untouchable to me, the Beatles were untouchable to me, you know, they, they were like rock stars, but when I started playing in bands, I got into new wave and punk bands in the late 70s and early 80s. And I love London Calling by The Clash. That is pro probably my favorite sort of rock, punk rock record. And one of the reasons I love it is because stylistically, the songs are all over the place. It's not one dimensional. They incorporate elements of all sorts of genres and music. So if you don't know London Calling by The Clash, it's fantastic. Go check it out. Awesome. Thank you. No, there's, that, I, that's... That's, those are some, some fantastic albums in there. I think uh, Sgt. Pepper is definitely my mom's favorite album. Um, we're going to go on to another question uh, from Ryan Deke, uh, who is a drummer in our Winds and Jazz program. Um, and uh, you got to hear him playing percussion because you uh, actually came to one of our performances of In the Heights. And so Ryan was, uh, was one of the percussionists that was in that performance. Uh, but Ryan asks, have you ever produced something that you thought sounded great and had someone tell you you had to change it? <laughs> yep, that's part of the business. You have to have pretty thick skin sometimes. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's happened a lot. It didn't happen so much when I started out, uh, you know, when I, I was doing records at Smart Studios because they were all independent budgets, you know, bands would come in and they'd re want to record in three or four days or a week or whatever. And uh, there was no one else to answer to. They didn't necessarily have a manager. They didn't have a label or a publisher. Um, after the success of Nevermind, uh, you know, I started working with much bigger budgets and a lot bigger bands. And of course, they had publishers, they had managers, they had labels, they had a &R reps. And all those people have opinions. And uh, I won't name names. I won't name names, but I had some very difficult records that I had to go back and remix things and re-edit things. And re they go, oh, we need 
sometimes the A&R person would say, oh, we need more back vocals in the chorus or the snare drum leads needs to be louder. And I personally think a lot of those people who gave me opinions, part of that was because they were insecure, one, and two, they didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> they had to justify their job. So they would just tell me, uh, put some back vocals in the chorus. I mean, that's such a stupid, obvious thing to say, yeah, more back vocals. Um, as I navigated through working with major labels, I got very picky about who I was going to work with in terms of trying to make sure there was not too much, um, what's the right term here, problems down the road. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't want to necessarily walk into a minefield. So I would sort of check out who's the A&R person, who's the manager, what's their vibe. And I would talk to the band, always talk to the band first. You know, I would want to sit down and, and sort of figure out where they wanted to go with the record, you know, what their vision was. I'd want to know what, uh, where the songs were. Of course, I had to hear the songs. But I did a lot of the stuff outside the band, too, to make sure there were, like I said, there were no minefields or potential traps I was going to go into where I was going to run into someone who was extremely difficult to deal with. So I have to say uh, in the last, like in the second half, like the last 10 or 15 years, um, I've been pretty good about that. I haven't had too many people who have uh, just been a pain in the butt, but there are those people out there who will be a pain in your butt. And um, in a way it can be a good thing to learn how to do that because you have to deal with the sort of psychology of making records together when the, the bigger a project gets, the more collaborative it is. And you have to be able to have thick skin again, but also understand sometimes what they're saying and, and, and maybe it's better. I'll give you one example here. Um, there was an A&R guy for Warner Brothers a couple years ago. I did a record with one of my favorite bands, Against Me. If you don't know Against Me, I love them. You have to check him out. Um, and one of the records we were doing, uh, White Crosses, there's a song called uh, I Was a Teenage Anarchist. And we originally, uh, uh, Laura Jane sets this whole verse up with just do, 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 with a really taut guitar riff and sings over it. And then there's with this bill, do you remember? And it goes into the chorus, but it went right back into, it builds up and goes in the chorus. And then the a &R person said to me, it builds up with a chorus, but then you need to do a chorus. And I was like, he's right. And so, cause we were working in Pro Tools, like this computer right here. Um, we took the second chorus and we cut and paste it and put it into the first chorus. So, it, so you'll hear, if you hear the song, you should check it out after this uh, Against Me, Teenage Anarchist. It, it, the first chorus was initially just a buildup, and then it went right back into a verse. But then I realized, don't bore us, get to the chorus. And so we put in the full chorus, and it made the song a lot better. It's like a double chorus to start after the first verse, but the first one's a build. And that's a case where the A&R person gave me uh, some really good uh, input and I took it to heart and, and it made the song better. So as much as I don't like to have people interfere with me, you have to listen to what they're saying because some, sometimes it can make, uh, the suggestion can make a song better. Uh, that's, that's awesome. Um, we're gonna move into something that's a little bit more technical, uh, but Sam Carter, who's a guitarist in our Winds and Jazz program, singer of multi instrumentalist who plays in a band called Beach Freaks, um, his question is, do you have any tips or tricks when it comes to EQ or compression on drums? Well, one thing I think that can help your mix a lot is to not boost EQ, but take out EQ. And by that, I mean, a lot of times you might hear a track, it could be a, a drum or it could be a guitar or bass, uh, when I first started out, I would just go, well, it needs more treble, and I would boost the treble at like six kilohertz or 10 kilohertz or four kilohertz, whatever. And then I would go, well, it needs more bass. And pretty soon I looked at the EQ band and everything was boosted. And I realized if you cut some problem problematic frequencies, you don't necessarily always need to boost the other frequencies. So these days, when I EQ something, I usually start by trying to take out a frequency that I think is not good in there. Usually it's in, in the mid-range, somewhere between 250 hertz and 
500 hertz or so, kind of the, the mucky stuff that can get into tracks. Sometimes if you take that and, and pull it back 6 dB or 8 dB, it will just open up the track. All of a sudden you hear the top end and the bottom end. You don't necessarily need to boost those frequencies. You still might want to add some sparkle on the top or you might want to add a little bit of 60 hertz or 100 hertz, especially if it's a bass or a kick drum or something. But uh, I, I, I found that just automatically boosting all the frequencies, sometimes you just chase your tail and, and just go you know, down a path that you keep doing more and more. And the more EQ that you add can become problematic because then the track can start sounding phasey. You get phase issues when you, when you over EQ things. So I would start by trying to take away the bad frequencies and see where that sits and then, and then boost. Um, in terms of compression, well, I love compression because it takes a track and it puts it up in your face. And uh, I, I use compression on pretty much everything I record in some form or another. Um, when I'm recording drums, the only things I record with compression are the snare with just a little bit of compression, just to sort of even out some of the dynamics. And I usually use something that's pretty fast. It's got a pretty fast attack and a pretty fast release. However, do not set the milliseconds on the attack so fast that it kills the transients. So I, I would set the attack somewhere between 10 milliseconds, maybe in 30 milliseconds, but then have a, as, as fast as the release can be, set it for that. So it just, it just takes down the thickness and, and you're right back up to the sound. Um, I, I rarely compress the kick drum when I'm recording. I will compress when I'm mixing. Uh, but one thing I do like to also compress when I'm tracking is the overheads and the cymbals and sometimes the room mics. Uh, usually though, I'll try to, if you, if you have enough microphones, I'll record room mics au naturel and then I'll set up another set or maybe just a mono one and really compress it like crazy. It's called a hype mic or, or the crush mic and just go crazy. So it kicks down like 10 or 15 dB. And sometimes if you just add a little bit of that in, sort of the pushing and pulling on the compression can make the track really exciting and just and make it sound crazy like the drummers playing like Keith Moon all of a sudden because there's always sort of this pumping going on, on the track. But I, I try to do that on a, a separate track. You know, back in the day when I had uh, eight tracks, I, I had to do that mix to a stereo mix. And now, uh, you know, with multi-tracking and Pro Tools or even when I did it on 24-track on tape, you can put, up, put the individual mics on different inputs on the channel so um but but i i you know i will compress but then a lot of times i compress even more in the in the mix and it just depends on what kind of a song you're doing you know i i have a tendency to not use that much compression when the song is more organic sounding you know like more piano acoustic driven or string driven if it's rock or, or uh, hip-hop or electronica i i use a lot more compression it, it sort of depends on the nature of the style of music you're working with I actually have a follow-up question to that, just for me, because um, this that's your answer is super interesting. Do you find that how a drummer tunes their drums also has an effect on how you end up, you know, doing EQ or compression of that particular drummer? Like, do you notice the difference in tuning of drums, how they tune their various drums on a drum set? Yeah, absolutely. When when I go in to do a session, one of the first things I do is I watch the drummer play, particularly the first song. Like, what is his style? Like, is he bash the hi-hat is he really hitting the cymbals hard um how dynamic it, is he on the snare some drummers hit the snare really consistently every single time some play lots of grace notes and then the dynamics are all over which is great for dynamics but harder to to capture when you're recording um so it, it kind of depends uh but in terms of tuning uh yeah, I think it's important that the, the tone of the drum sits in with the nature of the song. You know, if it's, uh, if it's a really fast song, 160, 170 BPM, like a Green Day or, or Foo Fighters song that's almost more punky, you can't have really thick, low detuned drums. They have to, because they have to be played really quick. They have, the drums have to be responsive and, and uh, have to sonically fit in the track. You know, if you're playing a, if you're recording a song that's 80 or 90 BPM, really slow with a lot of space, you can tune the drums down and give them all this weight and sustain. Uh, it, again, it depends on the, the song, Mr. D. It really, you want the drums to fit in the style of the song you're doing. And the slower a song is, the more you have to detune drums and 
and to uh, and to give them a lot of sustain. And the faster song is in general, I, I have a tendency to, to make the drums tighter and pop more. But again, that it, it depends on what you like. I mean, I, I've heard songs with the exact opposite, where they're playing really fast with really low detuned drums, and then just the in the opposite. So um, there are no rules these days. You know, with, with no rules out there, um, everything I'm saying you could throw it out the window if it doesn't work and, and do the exact opposite. So that's always a good thing to remember too. Awesome. Um, we're going to move to uh, a question that's more geared towards singers and songwriters. Um, and this is coming from Mary Lane Montero. Mary Lane's band Temperamental actually was, uh, they were the first band that won a uh, battle of the bands in year one when you were there. Um, and she was uh, one of our students. She's the guitarist, singer and songwriter. And Mary Lane asks, um, uh, what do you think the best way is to handle songwriting splits and copyright within a band? So I think she's asking specifically if you've got multiple songwriters within a tune. And uh, so what of it like when, when you've got multiple people contributing to the writing, how do you deal with the copyright of that? That is a slippery slope in a gray area where there are no rules. Uh, uh, in garbage, we made a conscious decision to always split the publishing between the four of us. So I get 25%. Whether I brought in the entire song and I have done that in the past or somebody else does, uh, we sort of took that cue from U2 and REM, bands that I both love. Uh, they always split the publishing uh, a quarter equally, no matter who brought the song in. That way there are never any fights about publishing, but that's not really the norm. Most people want to uh, uh, do the splits and get and get proper compensation, or you know, for whoever is doing the bulk of the work. Um, it's important to talk about it early on, you know, like when, once you've got a song, you don't have to talk about it the second you're recording a song, but but when it's getting done and mixed, you should say, "What do you think we should do for this the songwriting, the splits on this?" Because uh, the longer you let it go, sometimes the harder it can be, one, for your memory to, to be exact because the one person's memory may say, well, I wrote everything, and, and, and someone else will say, well, I wrote that course. No, you didn't. I wrote that course. You know, you can get into those kind of arguments. So it's better to try and be a little bit more open and transparent about that up front. It'll, it'll, it'll solve a lot of problems later. Um, there is that, uh, you know, especially in, in hip hop and pop music where you have a lot of songwriters, um, you know, there's the line or there's the, the, the thought, write a word, take a third. Well, it's hard to take a third if you have six or eight or 10 songwriters on, on a, a song. I personally feel that uh, there's two aspects to music. There's sort of the, the uh, there's the chord structure and the melodic structure of the music, and then there's the lyrics. So uh, in some instances, I think if someone's writing all the lyrics, they should at least get 50% of the song. Now, if they also wrote the music, they're going to get a bigger chunk of that. But sometimes the music is written by the band. So you may want to look at 50% of that's going to be split between, say it's a four-piece band. That's going to be split between the band, all, all four members, because they wrote it together. That's just in a, one example. And then the, the lyricist takes... 50% because they wrote the lyrics. Um, it, it's, it's a tough thing though, because um, there are no rules. There really are no rules. And you can talk to uh, music attorneys out there and they'll say the same thing. Obviously, may, maybe you guys have seen some of the court uh, things uh, recently with uh, Led Zeppelin just getting, uh, they, they actually, a court reversed in their favor um, because they thought they'd been a stairway to heaven had plagiarized the song by spirit and i listened to the spirit song and yeah there's a pretty good chance that jimmy page heard that and maybe it inspired stairway to heaven however stairway to heaven is its complete own masterpiece you know so again that's a gray area anyway i would try to talk it out and um because you know, I don't know what your circumstances are. There three or four lyric writers. You know, is everybody writing the music together? You sort of have to figure out who, who owns the bulk of each aspect: the, the musical aspect of a song and the lyrical aspect, and then figure out what the the weight is. But I, I would encourage you to try to take care of that earlier than later. Yeah, 
I, I love how you added just making sure that you're being transparent up front. And I think that's always the best way in the music world to move forward in a, you know, in an amenable way so that they're so that you avoid those conflicts because you know I think ultimately you just want to continue to make good music so you don't want that kind of stuff to get in the way of the music making process so um, thank you that's a great that's a great response um, we're gonna go in a different direction here and this is actually a question from one of our parents uh, Frank Vaccarella who's one of our awesome parents he's helped out with a ton of events on campus um, and uh, he had he, he's a huge Rush fan and um, so he asks, what are your thoughts on losing one of the greatest lyricists and drummers of all time with, um, with the loss of Neil Peart? Well, I am incredibly uh, bummed out that he has passed away. I mean, he's, he is one of the uh, greatest drummers out there, not even just for rock. He, he's just an incredible drummer. Um, when he passed away, I watched the Rush movie again, which I love. If you haven't seen the Rush movie, the documentary, uh, what's it called? Behind the Lighted Stage um, or something like that. Anyway, it came out about five or six years ago. I think it's on Netflix. It's absolutely incredible. You as students may want to watch it because it's about three, well, it's about two guys um, growing up in Canada and then they, Neil Peart joined them later. Um, but it's a really touching story. And for some reason, I mean, they have this all this footage of them on like a Super 8 video in their kitchen when they're trying to decide whether they're gonna to go to school or try to make in the music business. And it's like, who had the wherewithal to record this incredibly poignant uh, family discussion, you know, uh, when they were 16 or 17 years old. It's a really powerful film. And, and uh, especially because uh, uh, a lot of pretty heavy stuff happened to Neil Peart, you know, with his family and things over the years. So, um, but, I think it's called Beyond the Lighted Stage. Anyway, I, I urge you to uh, seek it out and, and watch it. it. It's a fantastic documentary. And I like Rush. I'm not a massive fan, but I like Rush. My wife watched it. She does not like Rush. And she loved the documentary. So I, I would highly rec recommend that you check it out. Awesome. Yeah. Um, our our uh, principal, Dr. Wallace, is actually with us. He was one of our judges in that first year. And he, he just put in the chat that it's on Netflix and it's a great documentary. So. And, and, and tell your wife I'll forgive her for not liking Rush. I'm, I'm a huge <laughs> fan no, myself. <laughs> no, but she loves them now because you, you know, it's not so much the music in the documentary is their personalities. I mean, they're just you just love them to death when you see the documentary. And it made me respect their music more seeing the documentary. So I, I would encourage all of you to check it out. You've got time to do it. So definitely get on Netflix and watch the Rush documentary. Yeah, I, I would second that. It's a fabulous documentary, folks. And Rush is an amazing band. When I was, when I was your age, age uh, students, uh, I went through a phase where I didn't do anything but listen to Rush. So. Right on. <laughs> And I, I, Butch brought up an important point, and I think everyone should should uh, should should uh, to, to think about this. But in the in the arts world and in the music world, there's so many people that you might not necessarily like their artistry, but when you get to know them as people, you might appreciate their artistry in a different way. So that's something to think about. You know, there's there's uh, there's two different aspects to people, and some people are able to like combine it together, and that's just who they are. And others have, you know, they might seem you know, very um, pretentious in their music making, but then they're really down to earth in person. And so, you know, there's different aspects to artists. And I'm, I'm glad that that Butch brought that up in terms of like, you know, his appreciation of that band and, and also in their personalities and stuff. So um, just, just adding my two cents into that. Um, right. We're going to ask a question from Lily, because I think this will be great for everybody. Um, and Lily, you know, Lily, but for everyone else, Lily is a cellist in our strings and orchestra program. And Lily asks, what starter recording equipment would you recommend for a hard rock band to use? Starter recording equipment. Well, the great thing about technology is completely leveled the playing field. When I started out, you pretty much had to use tape and uh, it was not cheap to buy even a four track or a, a eight track costs, you know, a couple thousand dollars. Now with a, with a laptop or a computer, uh, you have this entirely crazy palette of recording uh, things that, you're, that are available to you, whether it's a garage band or, or using, uh, I mean, Pro Tools is, I don't know what, what costs to get into that, but um, 
there are a lot of digital recording systems um, that are very affordable and very easy to figure out. So you can capture the sound into a, a, into a, a, to a medium. But there are other things about that sound I think are important, like what are you using to get that sound in? Like microphones, what kind of microphones are you using? Um, what kind of amplifiers are you using? Uh, you know, if it's a rock band, uh, you want to make sure the sound of the source is really good. So what are you using? Like if you're standing in a room rehearsing and playing, does everything sound good there? Because I can't necessarily fix it if I record it or you can't fix it. You want the source to be as good as possible. So whatever you're playing through, make sure your instrument is good. Your amplifiers are good. If you're singing a microphone, it's, it all sounds good. Um, once the source is good, then that, analog to digital input, uh, you want to try and make as good as you can within a limited budget, but microphones are pretty cheap these days. There's a lot of really good microphones out there on a budget that will sound awesome and, and different sounding microphones, you know, some that are, are dynamic and, and very bright uh, and tight sounding condensers, which are more open. You have ribbon mics, which are very soft. So if you have an abrasive sound, you can capture a softer tone going in. Um, but so I would look at the source first and, and then look at the chain that's going in. Once you get into whatever digital system you're using, uh, the possibilities are endless. The, even the, 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 like I said, the inexpensive starter systems are amazing sounding these days. So I would look at those three aspects of it and, uh, and then, you know, put your head down and do it. Awesome. Um, we're going to now, um, open this up. So if anybody wants to add any questions into the chat, I'm going to go ahead and read them um, to Butch. Uh, but um, feel free to, you can send them either to me privately if you don't want them to be public or just send them to everyone. We'll try to get through a couple of these because I have a couple more questions um, that I want to end with, um, with Butch. Um, let's see. Um, so Eli Rosenkin um, asks, you know, do you have any thoughts about software versus hardware? Um, and uh, I, maybe that's in particular, like what, you know, I, I think you kind of answered some of that in this question, um, but uh, do, you, do you put more value into software versus hardware or is it depending on the group or? Well, I am pretty much a, a Pro Tools user these days. Um, you know, I grew up recording on analog tape, which I love, but, uh, I since I've gone into Pro Tools, uh, it's like that's become my main medium to record him. A couple of years ago, I did a record with the Foo Fighters called Wasting Light, and Dave Grohl wanted to go back and record it on tape, and it screwed in my head a little bit. I literally had to go, oh, I got to change the process a little bit. How how you hit the the, the chains going through and what in, into the deck? You know, do you compress it more? Do you want more transients to come through? Um, and I realized I can't edit the way I love. I mean, what I love about Pro Tools, you can take, like I said, a piece of music and just paste it here. The, the, the editing in digital systems is, is incredible. But Dave threw down the gauntlet and uh, it, what I realized about analog tape was uh, you can't really ma manipulate it. So the performances are incredibly, uh, incredibly important. And uh, that's something I think we take for granted with recording digitally these days. Um, because it's easy to fix things digitally. So, but that being said, I still love uh, working with Pro Tools. When I was doing Green Day's 21st Century Breakdown, they insisted that I track all the drums on tape and then transfer them to Pro Tools. So after we set up the drums on day two, I had them go in and, and play a song and we very carefully set it up to play back from tape on, on one side of the board and from Pro Tools on the other side of the board. And I said, I want you guys to listen very carefully back and forth, which one is better, A or B? And we meticulously made sure the levels were exactly the same so one wasn't louder. And they listened for about 30 seconds, A, B, A, B, A, and they went B, and B was Pro Tools. And I'm not saying that to discourage anyone from using analog tape, but uh, I love analog tape, but it colors the sound. 
and you are more limited in terms of uh, how you can edit unless you transfer that tape back into a digital system. But um, so I, anyway, I'm uh, getting back to hardware. I use Pro Tools, and uh, a lot of people love Logic, which is amazing. I am not very good on it. So I, I, and I think it's in some ways logic is maybe better for people like to program and do electronic music and keyboards and MIDI. Um, I feel like Pro Tools is closer to uh, recording with tape in some ways. Um, and that, so that's my main uh, medium that I use. Um, as far as software, man, there's so much great software out there, uh, particularly with plugins. Um, just in processing sound, the, the, the possibilities are so endless of what you can do to manipulate sound and, uh, or fix something. Uh, and uh, I don't even, I can't even really tell you what, what my favorite software would be to work with, but um, the, it, the, it's, it's groundbreaking in the last like 10 years that the, the possibilities that you can use. So whatever you need to use or whatever you think you need to find, you probably can find it now because there are thousands of people developing new software that, that can uh, process audio. And I think that's a really cool thing. Awesome. Um, the next question is kind of uh, a hybrid from two different people. Um, and uh, this question is, what kind of educational background would be beneficial for a career in producing, recording, uh, and performing? But I think let's, if you can gear that more to pr production and recording, what, what kind of educational background do you think is best for that? Well, I know a lot of really talented engineers and producers who went to recording schools. And I think that's a really good thing. Uh, I did not go to one. You know, I had no one who taught me uh, other than uh, the guy I mentioned, Gary Cleave, who sort of mentored me early on. I never went to a studio and worked my way up, a recording studio and worked my way up. Um, that's how, sort of how you used to have to start. You'd start as the tea boy and then you become the coffee kid and then you become the tape operator and then you'd be the second engineer first engineer and it was a long process to became before you became an engineer or a producer uh there were no schools you know when i started out uh and i learned everything by the seat of my pants uh a lot of it happened on the fly and i'm very lucky that we started smart studios uh, with bands that also didn't know what to expect you know and because there was no budget and we weren't charging much money, they let me just experiment. And a lot of the early recordings I made sound terrible, but I learned from those. So the opposite is going to a recording school. And there are great schools out there. Um, I, there are some schools that I go to and I've done some teaching classes at. And uh, the instructors I meet and the engineers and producers who work at them are great. Uh, if you want that kind of experience, it can be invaluable because you're going to learn a lot about recording and engineering and about the music business or other aspects of it. Um, but I don't know if that's, if you have to do that, I guess I'm, I'm saying there are two paths you can take, you know, you can go to a school and, and do that. You can also figure it out on your own, you know, which a lot of people do. So um, either way, either path is a great choice. So there, there's no right or wrong there. Um, it just depends on, on where you feel like you're, you're going to figure out how to make your music the best it can be. I want to add something to that and then maybe you have um, some comments on this um, because I think in general, on the commercial side of music making, um, it's, it's, you know, there's, there's new schools that are popping up and there's new programs that are popping up um, to, to train people to do this. Um, but as you mentioned, there's different pathways that you can take um, because it's not like you need to have a master's degree to be a, 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 a producer recording engineer. You don't need to have those degrees. Um, and, and my thought is, and what I usually tell students is you, have, you just have to figure out where, where your weaknesses are and where your strengths are. Some people might be really good with tech, but they might not have the best ears. And so if you need to get training with your ears, then you might need to go to school. You might need to go to a more formal um, uh, institute to train your ears, because if you don't have good ears, it doesn't really matter what your knowledge of technology is. You're not going to be able to know how to direct those skills. Um, whereas on the other side, it could be that you're somebody who's got great ears, but you just don't know what tools you need to, to make it sound how you want it to sound. Um, so yeah, I don't yeah. have any comments on that, but that's usually what I tell students. Yeah, Mr. D, I say the same thing. Like when I, when I taught at some of the colleges around LA here, some of the recording schools and things, I think it's important to have a, a fairly well-rounded education in terms of music. I would not just figure out how to make hip hop beats 
or figure out how to record an orchestra. Uh, you should try to learn as much as you can in terms of recording and engineering. I'm, I'm talking more at this point about uh, engineering and producing um, because you don't know what opportunities or what your path may be. Um, I tell people to figure out how to mix live sound. Like if some or one of your bands said, hey, can you mix me in this show next weekend? Even if you have no idea how to do it, just say, yeah, I can do that. And you know what? You're going to figure it out pretty darn quick. Um, I tell people to try and, you know, young students to try and understand a little bit about the business, you know, about deals and about publishing. Publishing is very complicated, uh, the, the deals that can be struck. It's not that complicated, but it is. And so you need to have a little bit of knowledge. So if you're going to get into songwriting or negotiate deals, this goes back to kind of what's doing splits. Learn about that so you know about it. Um, you may start out thinking you're, you want to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, record rock bands. And someone may ask you to do a spot, a 30-second spot of some music. You should say, yes, I can do that. You might end up doing an incredible spot and someone hires you and all of a sudden you're scoring a TV or a film. You, 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 you have no idea if that could happen. And you may love it, you know? So um, I would try to uh, learn as many aspects about music, recording, engineering, producing, everything you can. And even if it's just a little bit of all those, or like Mr. D said about singing technique or all those things, the more you know, the more opportunities you will have as these paths you take, take you down different avenues. You know what I'm saying? So um, try, try to, try to be open-minded and learn as much as you can about all aspects of uh, music. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we're going to, we, I wanted to kind of end with some of these questions because I think they're more pertinent to what's currently going on. Um, and this was a great question from Ella Byer, who's in our, our musical theater conservatory. And she's a singer, songwriter, and guitarist. And Ella asks, um, once we get past this crisis, what promotional trends in music that were effective during the crisis do you think will have the most staying power? So maybe you could also talk about um, you know, how's, how to maintain your creativity and what things you can do during this time where we can actually physically make music in person. It's a great, great question. I think that this is opening up a whole new world of creativity for people. And I think that's going to continue to exist when we finally work our way through this pandemic. Um, people are realizing that, uh, yeah, I can record at home. I can send, I can do a drum track and put it, send a wave file on my buddy. He can put a bass track down send it to my other friend, he can put a guitar track down, send it to me, I'll put a vocal on it and mix it tonight. Um, there, there's a certain aspect of recording on your own that can give you a real uninhibited uh, outlook on, on how you track things. I think sometimes when you're recording with other people in a room, there there is pressure and pressure's good. I mean, I. I love being in rooms with people. I love going into a collaborative situation. And even if it's stressful, dealing with how to figure out how to make an ensemble work, there's something that's unbelievable about that. But there's something about getting up in your pajamas, picking up a guitar and writing a song. There's no one around you, no one to bother you, no one to criticize you. It can free you in a way that it just gives you a... a you might go down some creative avenues that you necessarily wouldn't if you were in a room with other people, if that makes any sense. So um, I think that moving forward, people are going to continue to work more at home, um, not just musically. I mean, I think a lot of businesses are probably going to have a tough time going back to, to what they used to do and might, you know, realize, well, I can work at home and, and accomplish exactly what I was doing there. So there's going to be a, a, a crazy shakeout and a, and a transformation of the world economically and just sort of how we all deal with this in the next six months to a year. But from a creative standpoint, I look at this as like a great time. Um, I, I've been, I was lucky we finished tracking a new garbage record about six weeks ago. So I'm working on um, editing the clean up things and Shirley's got a few vocals and things to do, but I'm getting ready to mix the record basically. Um, but I'm also finding creativity in, in all sorts of uh, different avenues. I, I have a side band called 5 Billion in Diamonds. 
in England and we've been writing songs together. It's all virtual file sharing and it's really fun. Um, I was telling Mr. D, I got a call from a writer who's putting a book together in England about uh, weird lo-fi recording techniques. And uh, I told him about uh, when we had Smart Studios in Madison, my, my studio there, that uh, at one point I was recording a punk band and the, the track sounded great, but the drummer was pounding the hi-hat so loud, it just sounded terrible. We couldn't get rid of the sound of the hi-hat. Well, in recording studios, you eat a lot of pizza. So we had all these old pizza boxes piled up in the back, and I went and took two of them and cut the bottom out of two of them and flipped them like this so that so the top was here and the sides were here. And then I cut a hole in, took the cymbals off, put one down on the, on the hi-hat stand, Put, the, put both hi-hat symbols on, then put the other one on top, suspended them from duct tape from a mic stand, and it completely removed the hi-hat from the, from the drum mix. Now the drummer wasn't very happy about that. I had to cut a V section in one of the, one of the uh, corners so he could, you could get your, uh, your stick on the hi-hat. Um, and it was, it was awkward for him to figure it out, but once, once he figured it out, it was great. And trust me, the mix sounded a hundred times better because all the other instruments became very clear because the hi-hat wasn't overpowering everything. Um, anyway, I, I'm digressing there, but for me, that was a really creative thing to do. Like, I am not an artist, I don't know how to draw. So I did a bunch of mock-ups. Let's see if I have some here. I was trying to figure out how to do it, so I had to start doing stuff like this. And I didn't know how to do it. It took me about four or five, all these different, uh, like, you know, trying to figure out how to do it. But I had so much fun doing it. It took me about three hours, and I sent it into uh, uh, this the Hamish, the guy who's the the writer in England, and he loves it. And he said it's great. All of the other people are saying the same thing. There, there are a lot of musicians or producers who are not uh, visual artists, or they do, have no talent uh, drawing. So the whole book is going to be super lo-fi. <laughs> I think it's going to be great. And, and I found that incredibly creative. Um, one of the, uh, our students asked what the title of that book is that, you're, that you've been talking about. Or, um, Say, what was that, Mr. D? What's the, what's the title of the book that you've been talking about? Um, uh, I think it's, it's just called Lo-Fi Recording Techniques. Uh, it won't come out probably for a couple months. Um, I, I can let you know when it comes out. It's probably just going to be an internet webzine. You, know, you can probably just get it, get it uh, It'll be, it'll be a bunch of stuff you'll be able to get on the internet. So I'll let you know when it comes out. No, that'd be great. We'd love to share it with everybody. Um, well, we've, we just got a few minutes. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. That's really lo-fi. <laughs> pizza boxes. Trombone yeah. players can be successful now, even as pizza delivery guys. That's right. <laughs> um, oh. I wanted to um, just end with allowing you, we got a, a few minutes left here and um, you mentioned that you had an idea about a project and I want to make sure that you have time to share that with all of our students. I'm sure they're all going to be stoked to hear this. So um, can you tell us? Some about that? Yeah, yeah, I do, Mr. D. I mean, uh, I am super bummed out that we couldn't do the Battle of the Bands. I was really looking forward to it. And, and I produced a, uh, a band called Silver Sun Pickups earlier this year and uh, Nikki was going to be one of the judges on it. And she's awesome. You'll love her. Um, but I started thinking about it when Mr. D asked me to do the Q&A. So what I want to do is I want to throw a challenge out to all of you. In the next week to two weeks, Mr. D will figure that out. Um, I want each of you, if you are inspired, to write a piece of original music and then submit it to me and Mr. D and maybe Nikki will we'll get some other people on. So it's sort of a battle of the bands, but not so much playing live. It's about composing something. And you can compose it on an instrument individually. You can uh, write it uh, like on piano and sing, it, or it could be just a vocal thing. It could be reeds or, or strings, uh, a violin, whatever you want, whatever you are, are passionate about, write a piece of music. Try to keep it around two minutes. Um, I don't think that uh, we want to hear like eight or 10 minute uh, gigantic epic numbers. Um, don't bore us, get to the chorus. But it could be any type of music you're inspired to do. And uh, you, you sh it should just be something you can record, literally perform it on your uh, iPhone, you know. Um, and I don't know all, how exactly uh, we'll figure all that out. Mr. D will get some sort of uh, a Dropbox or a school uh, 
uh, email address or something you can send it to. But we'll figure out maybe in a couple of weeks and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to everything. And uh, it'll sort of be a battle of bands. I'll try to pick, pick out my favorite compositions and I can give you some feedback on what you're doing. And uh, I want all of you to feel inspired. There's no pressure to do this, but try and just jump in and go crazy, you know, trying to come up with some really cool music, something that uh, inspires you. And Mr. D will, fi will fill you in on all the, the particulars and the details. Yeah, guys, yeah, guys. we are, um, I think that this is going to be a great project for a lot of you and, and could be some good motivation for some of us who've probably felt really down in the dumps about not being able to make music with our friends. Um, and a lot of you who were going to be a part of our Battle of the Bands, you still have an opportunity to have a little bit of that competition, but mostly just get some great feedback. So um, in, the, in the next uh, few days, just look for that information. We'll send it out to everybody so that you know how you can submit and, and sort of what the uh, requirements are going to be. Um, and it's awesome that Butch has already agreed to, to come back and, and we'll do another one of these with everybody in a couple of weeks. Um, so that we can um, have some follow-up on this, um, which is a great, by the way, I, I hope you guys realize the value of this for all of us. So many schools and uh, uh, music schools in particular are doing stuff like this where they're reaching out to, to master artists to, to, to do quick interviews. And it's amazing that they're giving of uh, this amount of time to us. But the fact that he's going to give us more time and give you guys feedback is such a great thing. So I'm encouraging all of you um, whether you feel comfortable writing or not to submit something, because I think that you will feel good after you've done it. No matter what the product is, you're going to feel good after completing that process. Um, so I, I hope most of you uh, take on that challenge, and I'll give you more information on that so you know where to submit everything. It'll most likely be a Google Drive. It'll be something simple, so don't worry about anything. Just record it, and um, you know you can record it on an iPhone. You know it doesn't need to be you know, amazing recording equipment, just like we're doing with the orchestra and wind ensemble, guitar ensemble right now. Just send us what you can and then we'll work it on it from there. Um, we're gonna take, before we say bye to Butch, I wanna do a quick screenshot of everybody. So um, we've got three screens worth of people. So if you wouldn't mind everybody turning on your camera so we can see your smiling faces um, and just kind of hold still for a little bit and I'll let you know when we are done. So everybody smile. Still going here. All right, one more. All right, we got it. Um, so 